we would follow the elephants all day and sometimes we'd be able to figure out over a long period of time what the context for a call was. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Our planet is home to more than 8 million species of creatures, but we understand the language of only one. We've long recognized the calls that birds or whales make, but we don't know much about what they mean. We are joined by Mickey Pardo, a postdoctoral associate at the K. Lisa Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, whose work is revealing insights into animal communication, including how elephants are using vocalization to address specific individuals. Dr. Pardo, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So I'd like to start with a little bit of background, and I'm wondering what got you interested in animal communication? I think I'd, I've always been interested in animals ever since I was a little kid. Um, and I always wanted to study wild animals, um, but I've also had uh, a really long-standing interest in linguistics and human languages. And so I think that studying animal communication was kind of a way to to satisfy both of those interests, like understanding how animals communicate with each other. How did that interest get you to elephants? I was interested in elephants for a few reasons. Um, one, because they're uh, a species with a very large brain and complex social system. Um, and both of those things are predicted to be associated with complex communication. Um, and from what we do know about elephant vocal communication, it seemed like there might be a lot of interesting stuff there, but it hasn't been as extensively studied as in some other species like chimpanzees, for example. So I thought there might be a little bit more to discover with elephants um, while still having a lot of opportunity for some some really exciting discoveries. Before we move into the actual work itself, can we talk a little bit about the different kinds of sounds they make? Because I think mostly people just are familiar with kind of the trumpeting sound. Yeah, so the the trumpeting sound is the one that people know the most, but but actually it's not the most common sound that elephants make. And and from my perspective, it's not even the most interesting sound. So, so the most common sound that elephants make by far is something called a rumble. And we actually can't hear the whole sound because part of it is below the range of human hearing. Um, and when you listen to it on most speakers, you're hearing even less of the sound because most commercially available speakers uh, don't pro don't reproduce sounds in that frequency range very well at all. So we're actually only hearing a small part of this of the call. Um, to an elephant, it would sound different. Um, but this call is super variable. It's produced in almost every behavioral context um and and it has a lot of different variations and i think that's where a lot of the really interesting stuff in elephant communication is going on it's almost like you know if you were to to study human vocal communication as if we were another animal species um you know like let's say you were an alien studying humans for the first time and you describe you're describing our vocal repertoire um you know you might you might notice that we make a lot of different sounds. We make laughter and, and crying and speech. And speech is probably where the most interesting one, you know, if you're interested in like complex communication and cognition. And I think similarly, the rumbles were a lot of the cool stuff from my perspective in elephant communications going on. Um, so like, for example, elephants can learn to make rumbles on command more easily than they can learn to make trumpets on command. They could they could do either one, but it's a, they have to like, it, it's almost like they have to think about a trumpet. Mm -hmm. Like you can see them sort of pausing before they can, they can reproduce that trumpet on command. And the same thing is true in humans. It's, it's a lot easier for us to imitate speech than it is to imitate say spontaneous laughter. Um, and similarly, I think that rumbles may be a more voluntary form of communication, whereas trumpets are more like an emotional outburst. They also make a lot of other sounds like roars, for example, which are these super, loud, powerful, um, roaring sounds, also quite variable, um, usually associated with um, sort of emotional contexts. Um, they make some shorter sounds like barks um, as well. And then Asian elephants uh, make these unique sounds called squeaks and squeals, which African elephants don't make. Um, and they're just like these um, bizarre high-pitched noises that you would never expect to hear from an elephant. Um, so they, they make a lot of different sounds, but I think the rumbles are the the most exciting one. I want to ask you about the challenges recording in the field. Well, one challenge, of course, is that these calls are partly below the range of human hearing. It's not so much an issue that we can't hear the calls in the field because we can still hear the higher harmonics in the call, but they don't sound as loud to us as they do to to an elephant, of course. And also 
our ears are really bad at localizing um, the low frequency sounds. So I couldn't wear headphones when recording. I had to just, you know, keep my ears uncovered so that I could at least have some ability to localize where the sounds were coming from. Um, and we had to use behavioral cues a lot of the time to figure out who was calling because it isn't it isn't always super obvious. They don't always open their mouth when they call. Um, the again, the call, it's sometimes hard for us to tell which direction the sound is coming from. Um, and we had to use specialized equipment to record these low frequency sounds because most microphones are not designed to handle such low frequencies. Um, so so that was sort of the the challenge with the recording, you know, from the equipment side and and from just like figuring out who's calling. Um, but then also, um, you know, we needed to to be able to figure out the behavioral context. And that required a lot of uh, practice, just observing the elephants, just to get a sense of, of what's going on when you see elephants interacting, it, especially when I started. Um, I often had no idea what was happening. I would just hear these calls and I had no idea why they were making them. And then as I got more and more experience, um, it started to be a little bit easier for me to identify um, what they might be calling about, you know, so we would follow the elephants all day. And sometimes we'd be able to figure out over a long period of time what the context for a call was. So, for example, um, if we started with the elephant family in the morning, we saw everybody who was there. And then later on, somebody started lagging behind the group um, until they were maybe, you know, 500 meters or kilometer behind the rest of the group. And then somebody else in the group um, sort of stopped and seemingly waited for them and started making a bunch of calls, we'd be able to infer, oh, they're probably calling to that one individual who's lagging behind the group. If we hadn't seen that that initial part of the context several hours earlier, it would have just seemed like an elephant was making calls for no reason. So being able to follow them all day and, and learn who all the different individuals in each family were um, was really important to, to kind of understand what's going on. Yeah, elephants are very slow animals in a lot of ways. Like the, their behavior takes place over a longer period of time than than we're used to in primates, for example. So, um, being able to kind of connect events that were very separated from each other in time and and put it together was really important for trying to figure out the context of a lot of these calls. Now, following into the next step, you were playing back the calls later. Can you tell me a little bit about the kind of responses you would see? Like, how were you able to connect the dots with the recording and the individuals responding to them? We filmed all the all of the playbacks where we played calls back to the elephants um, and then used those videos to to measure the elephants responses. Um, and the, the type of responses we got were hugely variable. So it ranged from completely ignoring the playback to lifting like the subject might lift her head up and look at the speaker and then go back to what she was doing. She might call in response, but not move. She might approach the speaker um, and she might approach and call. Um, she might call once or, you know, eight times. Um, and when she approached her call in like after hearing the playback was also very variable. So sometimes she called back right away. Sometimes it took a while. Um, so these were the things that we measured to try and see if there was a, an, a difference on average in response to calls that that we thought were the subject's name versus calls that we thought were somebody else's name. Um, and so we found that the on average, um, elephants would would vocalize more quickly in response to a call that was initially addressed to them than to a call that was initially addressed to someone else. Um, they would also approach the speaker more quickly on average in response to calls that were originally addressed to them. And again, they didn't always approach the speaker, but when we looked at it on average, they, there was a, they tended to approach more quickly in, in one condition than the other. And they also tended to produce more vocalizations on average in response to a call that was originally addressed to them. Using the, the random forest, the machine learning model, we were able to discern that calls addressed to different individuals are acoustically distinct from one another. But when you listen to those sounds as a human, um, it's very difficult to hear the differences between them. Um, and that's partly because we're not hearing the whole sound. So I've noticed that if you play the calls back at, say, five times their original speed to increase the frequency to so it's totally within our hearing range, um, 
you do hear more differences between the calls. I still don't know if I can necessarily identify the name of a particular individual, but I can at least hear differences among the calls much more readily when I play them back at about five times the original speed. Um, and and when you look at the spectrogram of the call, which is also, um, it's, it's like a visual representation of the sound. Sometimes it's easier to see differences between different types of rumbles um, than just listening to it. Taking the data set and processing it, can you talk a little bit about using the language model to process it? So we use a type of model called a random forest, um, which is a type of machine learning model that was actually developed in 2001. And basically what it does is it takes um, a bunch of observations that are labeled. So um, in this case, each observation was a call and the label was who that call was addressed to. And um, we, we gave the model the information of who the call was addressed to. And we also gave it several, uh, or I, I think we used 94 different feature variables that described in some way the acoustic or the sound patterns of that call. And then the random forest tried to learn associations between the sound patterns of the call and the identity of the individual that the call was addressed to. So we we fed it part of the data to learn on, and then we tested it on another part of the data to see how well it performed on calls that it hadn't seen yet. And the idea was that if these calls contain something like a name, then the random forest should be able to, to predict with better than chance accuracy who a call was addressed to just from the acoustic structure of that call. Um, and that that's exactly what we found. It correctly predicted the receiver for about 27.5% of calls, uh, which may not sound like that much. But again, when you remember that we didn't expect them to use names in every single call, but we didn't know ahead of time which calls might have a name. So we just had to give it all the calls and hope for the best. Um, and if it had just been... if. So we also compared the performance of that random forest to what it would have been able to do if we had fed it garbled data. And um, on average with garbled data, it only got 8% right by by random chance. So 27.5% was statistically significantly better than 8%. Like the chance of getting 27.5% right with garbled data is like less than one in 10,000. Um, so so that you know is pretty strong evidence that there's something in the calls that allows a random forest to to correctly predict at least some of the time who that call was addressed to how does understanding how animals communicate aid conservation efforts that's a good question um i think there's a few different ways that it might so one is that this type of study especially on a charismatic animal like elephants and with something like names that just reminds us of ourselves and and helps us identify with the animals more i think that can help people care more about animals and and therefore um number one it may help raise money for conservation and two um it could potentially increase tolerance for elephants at a time when human elephant conflict is one of the biggest threats to elephant survival i mean obviously if you're a farmer and elephants are eating your crops like knowing that elephants have names is is not going to really make any difference you know, so it's it's not like that's going to solve the problem, but but I think um, there is there is you know historical precedent for when people care about animals more and identify with them more, it increases their their willingness to protect those animals. You know, we saw that with humpback whales um, in the 1970s when Roger Payne figured out that um, whales sing. Um, that kind of helped galvanize a movement to ban commercial whaling. Um, so so i think it could help it could help with that in terms of changing hearts and minds um and then sometimes there are ways in which it can have practical benefits for conservation so w one of the things that i'm working on right now actually is uh, bioacoustic monitoring so using recordings of animal sound um not to understand how the animals are communicating with each other per se but to monitor their populations in a non-invasive way and there are some ways in which we can combine studies of animal communication with passive acoustic monitoring. So for example, a lot of animal calls contain information, not just about what species is calling, but also about things like the sex and age and reproductive status of the caller, all of which are really important variables for population models to assess you know, whether a population is gonna go extinct or whether it's doing okay. Um, and so if you can 
extract that kind of information from passive acoustic recordings, you may be able to get um, vital statistics on the health of a population just by putting out audio recorders into the environment. Um, sometimes communication can also be really helpful for rehabilitating animals. So if we understand how they communicate with each other and we're trying to say like rehabilitate orphaned elephants and reintroduce them to the wild, um, then you know, understanding how they communicate and how they learn their their calls may be really important for teaching them to survive in the wild on their own and, and interact appropriately with other elephants. Um, or in, in other examples, um, people have uh, have used playback of, of bird calls to encourage birds to settle on islands where they've previously been wiped out um, so that you can you can kind of like reestablish a, a population by recruiting other individuals, by playing back their species calls. Um, or some people have proposed that maybe we could mitigate human elephant conflict by playing back certain calls that let the elephants know to stay away from a certain place. That's still speculative at this point. I don't think we we have like a good system of of implementing that yet, but um, but that's a possibility that, that could materialize down the line. So pivoting a little bit, I wanna ask you about your grants in the past. How has NSF support made a difference in your career? I mean, it's been it, it's been instrumental. So I, you know, when I was uh, a PhD student, I was fortunate enough to get an NSF GRFP. Um, so that supported me for um, for a good part of my PhD. Um, I also got an NSF DDIG or Doctoral Dissertation Improvement Grant, which I don't think that program exists anymore, but. Um, but I did, you know, when I was a when I was a grad student, that that really helped um, help me hire some field assistants for my work and um, and do you know additional research that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Um, and then this, you know, this postdoc that I did with the elephants, um, it was funded by an NSF postdoctoral fellowship. So if I hadn't had that fellowship, there's no way I would have been able to do this project. My my postdoc supervisor George Wittemeyer didn't have funding for this kind of project. Um, and, and there was no way that I would have been able to do that if I hadn't had that NSF support. As we wind down here, I want to ask you about what you're doing now and what you're doing in the future. What is it like working with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and what's kind of the next few years look like for you? I, I really, really love it at the, the Lab of Ornithology. I was there as a grad student um, and then I left to do the, the postdoc with elephants and now I'm back, although I'm working remotely. Um, as a as a postdoc at the lab again, um, it's a really great environment, um, and they do really exciting, cutting edge research on on birds and on bioacoustics more generally. Um, and so it's it's been really valuable for me to be able to learn from some of the world's experts on bioacoustics. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is, is sort of combine the experience that I'm getting now with doing passive acoustic monitoring of birds um, with the kind of work I was doing with the elephants. So. Um, I, my my hope is to stay in academia and get a faculty position. And if I can do that, then I would like to to start a research program where I continue studying vocal communication in elephants from a basic science perspective, but also incorporate passive acoustic monitoring of elephants um, to help uh, to help with their conservation. Um, so right now, I'm I'm working on passive acoustic monitoring with birds, um, and uh, and I'm hoping to kind of meld that with what I was doing before. So like both vocal communication and passive acoustic monitoring. Special thanks to Mickey Pardo. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.